The Unshackled Waves, Episode 77. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for another review episode. And we are lucky to have for uh, his first uh, Unshackled Waves podcast is uh, Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts. Welcome to the show. Uh, g'day, Tim. It's, uh, it's good to be with you and it's a privilege to be on the show. Oh, well, you've picked a oh, pretty wild news week to, to come on the show. Uh, so in Australia, we've had yet another dual citizenship controversy, which of all people, uh, Barnaby Joyce, it was revealed he's a New Zealander by descent. Uh, he's refused to step down as Deputy Prime Minister while the case is before the, the High Court. So it's uh, made question time with the Labor Party quite tense this week. And it's also taken another twist as uh, Julie Bishop has accused the Labor Party of conspiring with the New Zealand Labor Party to uh, expose uh, Barnaby Joyce's dual citizenship in an effort to uh, bring down the Australian government. So there's been accusations of uh, conspiracy and treason abound, which is quite absurd. Uh, in the United States, there was the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this was to protest the removal of a Confederate statue. It was attended by many uh, alt-right and white nationalist groups. Uh, as always, with these type of demonstrations, Antifa showed up and provoked uh, qu quite a uh, devastating amount of violence, which ended up with uh, one person uh, dead, uh, two police state troopers dying in a helicopter accident. And now Donald Trump has uh, been accused of not condemning uh, neo-Nazis and white supremacists enough. Uh, coming back to Australia, the same-sex marriage plebiscite debate continues. Uh, we haven't had any polling yet, but the betting markets uh, on this uh, vote have tightened. Uh, both sides of the debate are now mobilising their campaigns. Uh, they're both accusing each other of not engaging in a respectful debate and uh, being quite uh, triggered, uh, if I will use that word. And we've also had probably the most recent news today, Pauline Hanson came into question time in the Senate today dressed in a full burqa and then asked a question to Attorney General George Brandis about uh, banning it. Uh, she's been widely condemned by uh, the, the major parties for doing this, but it's worth asking the question, did this stunt, did it achieve uh, its objective, did it get us talking about the, the issue? But we'll start with the uh, well, more dual citizenships. Uh, so obviously it's Barnaby Joyce this week to be revealed to be a New Zealand citizen by descent, and that, that's because his father uh, was born a British subject in New Zealand because Australia uh, and New Zealand didn't have citizenship before they passed laws in 1948, so everyone born in Australia and New Zealand was uh, a British subject. But the way the New Zealand uh, law was uh, drawn up, uh, it means that Barnaby Joyce uh, unwittingly is a New Zealand citizen by descent and it's been confirmed by the New Zealand Interior Energy Ministry. So on the on the face of it, he appears to be uh, ineligible under Section 44 to be in Parliament, but it's it's taken the Section 44 debate uh, into 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 a whole new field that is the High Court interpreting it too strictly. Well, there's a whole lot of variables that can happen here. Um, I'm unsure of the composition of the High Court, but if we've got more conservative judges, um, then people like Canavan, Roberts um, and Joyce could all be in a considerable amount of trouble. There, there's, there's quite a few parallels between the Roberts case and the Joyce case as well, because they were both considered um, British subjects, as you will, and then they, they well, Joyce was born here in Australia, but um, uh, Roberts wasn't. He was born to uh, believe in an Australian mother and a Welsh father. But um, it's getting very, very tenuous here. It almost looks like half the, um, the Senate and the House could be pulled up with this because we, we are in a very multicultural society. So, um, 
it is rather interesting. I was really shocked to hear this the news of joy, so I thought it would be more likely that Tony Abbott would become Prime Minister again than here in that Barnaby Joyce is a Kiwi. Now, um, Paul Murray said that he's the most Aussie man he's ever seen. He's got a flag post at his home. He walks by it every day. He loves his nation. Um, and I'm certain that uh, if he had to stand down, he would recontest his seat in New England and win comprehensively. Yeah, um, that- I've heard this from... Uh, yeah, uh, from a Nationals insider. Yeah, and certainly the the internet's had a lot of fun with uh, Barnaby Joyce, New Zealand uh, uh, memes. It's uh, with uh, because uh, the new, if there was a by election in New England, uh, of course, uh, Tony Windsor has said that he put his hand up. Now Barnaby Joyce, he easily fought off Tony Windsor last federal election, but of course. You, st- you still never know that the government would go through uh, a, per- a period of quite uh, a- a anxious worrying whether they'd hang on to their uh, majority, which is which is probably why they've um, been, uh, been so strident this week in uh, in, in having Joyce uh, remain as deputy prime minister and saying they're they're quite confident that that he will remain in parliament. Yeah, the thing with uh, the High Court is, uh, as I said, they they've interpreted this section quite strictly. That even if you're, you know, un- unaware of your your citizenship, they they go by the principle ignorance is, is no excuse. And it was interesting the article that I wrote this week uh, uh, about uh, section forty four. This uh, m- most people still think that it's it's an appropriate uh, uh, section to have, and they. Uh, and they don't take kindly to like MPs from either side, you know, not bothering to check whether they're uh, citizens of another country or not. Well, the interesting thing here is that um, the, the Turnbull government could be forced into a minority government. Uh, now, this is a big problem, especially with the news that Bob Cutter says that he may not support the coalition, uh, which shows that um, that they they could be in dire straits. Although I I, I hear that there are um, definitely some independents in the House that may may form a minority, uh, help form a minority government, uh, much like um, what, what um, Theresa May had to do, but still it shows that um, uh, Turnbull's house, if you will, is a house of cards and, and not really um, built on solid foundation. And it, it's worrying to see the uh, coalition government in, in such dire straits. Well, that's probably why uh, the government and Julie Bishop in particular became quite uh, unhinged, in my opinion, the fact that they uh, tried to turn it on the Labor Party and accused them of conspiring with the New Zealand Labor Party, or that was they uh, were keen to point out a foreign uh, political party to, as they saw it, bring down the Australian government because uh, and a staffer in Penny Wong's office got a New Zealand Labor backbencher to ask a question about uh, New Zealand citizenship by descent to the uh, Interior Minister of New Zealand, uh, Peter Dunn. And so apparently this was the, the smoking gun that uh, the Labor Party was uh, enga- engaged in treason and a conspiracy. And so they've basically turned what's a domestic embarrassment for them into a, an international incident because uh, uh, the, the Labor Party over there have had to say that, you know, oh, we probably shouldn't have asked that question, and Bill English saying, oh, you know, I don't, uh, uh, I don't, I don't think this will affect the relationship, because Julie Bishop, she actually said she, if, because New Zealand's about to go to, into election, she would find it hard to work with a uh, Labor New Zealand government, given that they'd done this, which is... <laughs> she, she, She's totally accused, out of luck. Yeah, she's accusing uh, New Zealand Labor of interfering with Australia, but she's actually tried to influence New Zealand politics with that. And her job um, as foreign minister is to is to liaise and and not to to directly influence uh, for, you know other other countries' domestic policy, but it's to liaise and to make sure that we've got good international relations. Now I, I can't imagine that if New Zealand Labor gets elected. Julie Bishop's made these comments. Um, I think that we could be on some rocky ground, uh, and I and I don't think that it was very wise of, of Julie to make those comments. And um, and it just shows um, 
well, it simply just shows that she um, may be, how do I say, thinking she's bigger than she is, thinking she's more important than she is, not knowing when to keep her mouth closed, and maybe that's because of some weak leadership from Malcolm Turnbull, uh, not keeping his cabinet in line, and, and I think that's just it's, that's just showing through there. Oh, it's a it's a sign of desperation in, in in my opinion. The fact they wanted to deflect from the fact that they've now got two uh, senior government ministers before the High Court under uh, Section Forty Four, and yeah, Julie Bishop, she was you know rightly you know ridiculed by the Labor Party in Parliament. I mean, they have, they have, whenever. There, there was a, a question from the backbench ask, asking about, you know, this alleged conspiracy, like the Labor Party just burst into laughter, and there was an actually quite a a, a good uh, speech by uh, Penny Wong, or should I say, <laughs> a good speech by her for once. Uh, Stop letting Penny Wong, Tim. Oh, well, I'm just saying she, she was right in, uh, in this uh, point of view. And uh, it was actually Andrew Bolt who drew my attention to this Penny Wong speech where she said, oh, yes, we've got to be worried about the, the Kiwis under the bed and correctly pointed out, uh, uh, don't forget that the NZ in Anzac stands for uh, New Zealand. So, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, scared about, you know, f uh, foreign influence from New Zealand. I mean, yeah, if... Like, no conservative commentator <laughs> has, you know, f uh, followed the government line on this. So they're, they're clearly out on their own. Well, um, I, I really don't know what to say. But for me to, um, to, to acknowledge um, that the Labor Party is right is a very hard thing for me to do. But I have to, in this instance, uh, Julie Bishop has no place uh, to get involved in another country's domestic issues, and as well, um, you can just just see it's complete and utter turmoil in Canberra. Uh, Canavan, now Joyce, uh, who's next? Okay, it, it's just uh, getting uh, ridiculous. Um, I can, if it gets any worse, we'll definitely have another election. Uh, the government's in a state of chaos; they can't govern. Um, they're not really getting any big legislative achievements done either um, and we're not seeing this progress uh, that Turnbull was was promised when he when he came in Abbott 30 news polls whatever now Turnbull's had 17 lost news uh, polls his cabinet's falling it's just going into disarray uh, the man really needs to have a look in the mirror and um, assess where he's at otherwise I'm afraid Bill Shorten will be the next Prime Minister of Australia and God help us well, actually, the, the main legislative item this week was um, uh, negotiating media reform through the Senate, but that's, of course, just been like, uh, all this uh, citizenship talk and, of course, the, the Hanson st stunt today. I mean, it's been pushed to, to the, the bottom of the, the news feed. Uh, so, yeah, they're... Uh, all, all of the, the oxygen's being sucked up by this uh, dual citizenship issue. And uh, Malcolm Turnbull tried to um, uh, chat, uh, get Bill Shorten to agree to a full audit of uh, MP citizenship this week, which uh, Bill Shorten refused because he's quite confident that uh, Labor's internal processes are much better than the, uh, the, the, the coalition's. Um, and there, there is widely speculated that there are more dual citizens in Parliament who know it, and this is why Cory Bernardi is calling today for uh, Parliament to be suspended until we like sort out who is actually eligible to be in the place. Yeah, well, who really knows what Cory's motives are for saying that? Is it to get a big chunky headline to, um, to push his party? Or is it a sincere belief? I find it hard to decipher between those two. But to to have the prospect of having potentially a quarter of our elected officials being ineligible is a very scary um, prospect. And I, I do think that Corey, in that sense, um, does have some validity to what he's saying. Uh, but but his motives are what I'm unsure of. But it does make sense. Uh, there are definitely things that we need to be focusing on. We're getting caught up in quagmires like the citizenship debacle, 
same-sex marriage. These are all really non-issues um, uh, with, an, with a, a stagnating economy and what have you. Um, and we, we really just need to, to push for um, smaller governments, lower taxes and basic um, smaller liberal principles and um, the government's failing to do that. Uh, well, it is the, the the law. I mean, it's in the constitution that you can't be a dual citizen and, and sit in parliament. So the reason why the, this issue is so prominent now is because uh, our politicians have been so sloppy that you know, they haven't even bothered to check they're complying with the, the constitution. So, yeah, it's the, the politici politician's own fault for, you know, not not following the law. And the question is, who, whose fault is it? Is it the party having poor internal processes or is it the candidates themselves um, not making sure that they are in fact eligible to be selected, uh, well nominated at, at the party level? So let's move over to what the, the other big international story this week was, the uh, Unite the Right rally, which was in Charlottesville, Virginia. Now, it was organised to protest the removal of Robert E. Lee, who was a, a, a statue of him, uh, who was a, a Confederate uh, general. Now, the, the rally was mainly organised by alt-right and white nationalist groups. And, of course, if... Richard, if uh... If there's any rally which uh, you know has any tinge of being right wing, then like left wing groups, including Antifa, Black Lives Matter, of course, arrived to counter protest. And as I mentioned, uh, a protester was killed when a car drove through uh, a crowd of protesters, and there was uh, two state troopers who died in a helicopter crash, which was uh, monitoring the uh, the the protest. Now. The, the alt-right and the white nationalists have been blamed for the violence and the media has been eager to point out that there were uh, people there with like the Nazi flag and uh, Klansmen uh, there. So the, the, the mainstream media and also all like all the establishment politicians, uh, Democrat and Republican, they, they've all you know said, oh, this is all the fault of these neo-Nazis, uh, white supremacists, when, uh, you know, Trump, he has correctly pointed out that it was, like, as always, the, the leftists who uh, instigated this violence. Um, well, Tim, there are many parties to blame, OK? Uh, we've got Antifa, of course, being probably the provokers, but... Uh, ben Shapiro rightly pointed out that we don't really know who started the violence. So I'm wanting to wait for the facts to come in on that ground. Also, the police were ordered to stand down by the mayor. Uh, that shows complete negligence at the hands of the mayor. He let the, or she let the violence happen there by um, making the police stand down. And also the event organisers uh, are to blame here, I guess, for... Um, their, their permit was revoked, I believe, and they went ahead and, and protested with the knowledge that there would be no police protection uh, from the anti-communist uh, thugs. So it it I was, think that all parties are. It was revoked initially, the permit, but uh, it was reinstated because the uh, American Civil Liberties Union appealed to the, the federal court and they, they, they got it reinstated. So they did... Uh, ha have a have a right to be there, um, yeah. And obviously, like you know, the the uh, the, the people who organise these the, this event, such as you know uh, Richard Spencer and David G, I don't you know agree with them. And and people who are um, trying to draw attention to uh, Antifa's uh, uh, tactics here and and their violence are accused of you know siding with the you know alt right white nationalists, which which we're not. We're we're making like, what I'm trying to make sure is that the the left don't get away with you know the the chaos that they they caused here because it's it's not just uh, this uh, this event even if the the crowd was much more unsavoury than the others they've also um, provoked violence in uh, Berkeley uh, California uh, so it's you know they uh, it doesn't matter if you are you know are actual Nazis or uh, you know just uh, genuine you know, uh, American patriots, like, uh, the Antifa violence needs to stop. 
Uh, well, you can't really call Antifa, Antifa, anything but domestic terrorists and thugs who have the the goal of destroying property, ruining lives. And the thing that disgusts me most with this Antifa business is they get women into these riots now uh, to fight men. So they throw a few punches and they're knocked out. Um, in my opinion, um, people, women don't really belong in a situation where there's brawling and violence. And I think that the men who punch the women also have to have a little hard look at themselves because that's disgusting. But to see that happen isn't good. Uh, and that's where the feminists will say there's no difference between men and women. You can clearly see that there is in a fighting situation. Um, and I think that's disgusting what Antifa are doing, putting their, uh, putting women at the front lines of these riots. Um, and I think that's a major concern as well. Uh, I noticed that that was something that Ga Gavin McGuinness pointed out, that, you know, Antifa, yeah. they, they're eager to throw women into the, into the front line, which is clearly jeopardising their, their safety. Now, of course, the, the aftermath of it has been a story in itself because Trump has, he's, he's condemned both sides. He said there was violence on, on both sides. And, yeah, but, but he's also, you know, correctly pointed out that uh, it was... You know, the mainly you know anti far and the leftists who who provoked this, and like he uh, and he said you know he condemns neo Nazis and white supremacists, but you know the the media and the establishment politicians they they're accusing him of like making excuses for them and also being an enabler uh, of them. I think Trump is probably one of the most progressive Republican presidents that has ever held um, the Oval Office. Accusing Trump of being a xenophobe, a sexist, a white supremacist is just ridiculous. Uh, it's just a ridiculous notion. Over the years, uh, he's had a black girlfriend, his wife's an immigrant, um, and he, he's, um, he was friends with Michael Jackson, for instance. So to, to accuse him of being some kind of uh, bigot uh, is, I think, ridiculous. Man doesn't have a control over his tongue, but I think his heart's um, not tainted by kind of uh, that kind of bigotry that the media tries to tag him with. The, the, what the media have been uh, try, uh, trying to to point out is that uh, his his condemnation at the because they're they're eager to like promote uh, these alt right people like Richard Spencer and David Duke said that no Trump wasn't you know condemning us and you know we uh, you know we we still support him which the media are saying well look your um, your condemnation it, it it didn't appear to uh, to be interpreted as such by by these figures, so you know it's it's clear that your comments weren't strong enough. And the other issue I noticed they uh, had a quarrel with was the fact that he didn't disavow these people quick enough. Now you you can't win; they're against you. And trying to make um, peace uh, with these people um, is, as Trump noticed, with the media establishment is a waste of time because they will just bend and twist anything uh, to make a Republican president uh, seem to be evil. And they're putting people like Dave Rubin, an open homosexual and Jew, in his Nazi bracket. They're putting Stephen Crowder in that bracket. They're putting Ben Shapiro in this bracket. They're calling everybody Nazis. And then a man comes through with a dodge, runs over a poor woman, injures 19 people, and the word Nazi has no meaning. Uh, the media uh, is to blame for um, calling the people of middle America stupid race, whatever, for years and years and years, this has a bad effect on top of the poor education system. Uh, these are all just the cumulative factors that, um, that are creating the perfect storm, if you will. And I think the reason why, you know, Trump, you know, he didn't want to condemn everybody there because he knew that there, you know, were, were people there who just wanted to, to protest the, the taking down of this, you know, statue because it's, it's, you know, trying to erase a part of US history, which is like, regardless of like what type of people showed up, uh, the, the fact was that this statue sh should not be taken down. Well, let's look at the Middle East. Okay, the Baghdad 
uh, until 30, 40 years ago, was described as the Paris of the Middle East. And then we had this wave of regressive fundamental Islam that wanted to erase history and look at what ISIS are doing in the Middle East. They are actually using the same tactics that Antifa are using. They're actually pulling over um, statues. They're actually blowing up mosques. So these, this is pretty much terrorism. It's trying to erase history, trying to change history uh, to mean something that it's not. And if we forget the past, uh, we will make the same mistake in the future. Oh, well, just in the past few days, uh, Antifa, they, tore, they, they actually took it upon themselves to tear down a Confederate statue in, in North Carolina. And it, it, was, it was interesting to con, uh, contrast that with the, there was a protest outside because there's a statue, believe it or not, of Vladimir Lenin in Seattle. So... Um, Right, right, right wing protesters. They, you know, they they were there, you know, calling for the the statue to to be like taken down. But of course, they're not going to commit an illegal act of, you know, like uh, vandalizing a public monument. They want to, you know, taken down through, you know, the proper ways. They're not going to take it upon themselves and engage in vigilanteism. So I think that's a, a good contrast between the two sides. I still think that we need to be the side of politics that uh, encourages civility uh, and honesty and uh, meritocracy. And I think that we are, but I think there are some rogue elements um, who are in our camp, the Jared Taylors, the Richard Spencers, that we should disavow because I think that the right is the home of kind of classical liberalism, uh, which is, you know, pro individual liberty and that's good but we need to disavow the rogue elements of our movement so they don't tarnish um, what we've been making up oh yeah ab absolutely i agree um but i think uh we also want to and this is where trump's getting into trouble make sure that you know we also you know highlight you know what the what the left is doing as well and you know we just not need to you know, dismiss this, you know, it was entirely the, you know, the fault of the, the far right, the, the left played their role as well. And th this is why, you know, Trump has said it was both sides. Well, rightly so. Um, I, I largely, I, I agree with that, Jim. I, I agree with that. But um, I, I come down harder on the people in, in my house, obviously, because I see them as disrupting where we're going, we're going in a good direction. It seems to be a global turn to kind of classical liberal ideas. Uh, but I think the left is largely, if not in nine out of ten cases, has been the instigator of violence, extreme violence. Um, you just look at the streets all across America, um, there's just been extreme violence. It's all instigated by the left. Um, and I saw one instance, one ironic in, uh, instance where Antifa actually threw, I think, a Molotov cocktail at a Starbucks, but they were inadvertently funding their activity. Oh, yeah. Uh, but they, but they, um, they blew up the Starbucks, pretty much. Okay, so let's move on to, well, the, the topic that's probably going to be dominating the news over the, the next few months, which is the, the same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite. We talked a bit about it last week, but the, the campaign is fully underway now. It's interesting to note that there's been a massive spike in electoral enro enrolments. Um, it's, some commentators seem to think this will benefit the yes side because they're mainly young people who normally uh, wouldn't uh, bother to, to vote. Uh, the campaigns on, on both sides have begun. Well, the I watch a lot of Sky News and the, the marriage equality advocates, their ads are almost on an endless loop, but I noticed that the uh, traditional marriage side, they launched their official campaign site, Coalition for, uh, for Marriage. Uh, now, it's, the thing that's really like, uh, irritating me about this debate is that I think both sides are being you know, immature. They're both accusing the other side of engaging in hate speech and trying to like, be a victim. Like, obviously, the same-sex marriage advocates you know, say that you know, there's, uh, pe people are being homophobic towards them, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
comparing them with nasty people while the um, traditional American advocates are, you know, saying, well, you know, we're being called, you know, bigots because, you know, we just don't want to redefine marriage. And, and it's just, it, it seems like really immature for me. So I, you know, criticize, you know, both sides with this. I think that the um, people who are supporting traditional marriage uh, do have a point because the, the left-wing bullying that happens to these people and intimidation. I saw you cover it, Tim, I uh, believe, uh, a Liberal Party meeting that uh, Margaret Court was coming to. Um, left-wing protesters, left-wing agitators outside bullying and intimidating people. Um, so they do have some validity to what they are saying there. But, but the whole victimhood card I don't agree with, saying, oh, whatever, whatever. But actual intimidation uh, from left-wing protesters is inexcusable. Um, and But equally, what's equally ridiculous is the fact that Bill Shorten says that the, the gay community uh, suicide rates will spike. And I think that is inherently bigoted as well. It's almost saying that a gay person can't deal with merit debate, um, isn't up to the rigors that you know any other person is. And I think that that's wrong bigoted and it's almost homophobic in its own in its own way uh, and then he's also a hypocrite for blocking the same-sex marriage plebiscite in the senate and then apparently being the biggest proponent of it so i think there's hypocrisy on both sides of the spectrum here yeah, I definitely. Like, I just want to, you know, be able to, you know, de debate the issue of, you know, whether we should legalize same-sex marriage with, you know, without without both sides, you know, to use the expression being triggered. Like the, the the pro same-sex marriage side, there's this Twitter hashtag called, you know, respectful debate, uh, where they list like, you know, look at all this, you know, mean, mean stuff that that people are are saying about us, and and it's and it's also made up of like. You know, basically just, you know, people just, um, you know, basically making like, you know, gay jokes, like they're, they're highlighting that, like, you know, this is, you know, so offensive. And it's like, well, you know, like people have made like gay jokes forever. Like, I don't think because there's a plebiscite, you know, you need to like, you know, give it more prominence than it is. I mean, it, it, you know, just, you know, highlighting, you know, every like fa Facebook comment that's critical is is just like over the top. Well, we are entitled to freedom of speech, whether we actually have a constitutional protection for it or not. I think that it's an innate human right um, and that people will ostracise themselves if they make outlandish claims. Um, but I still think that highlighting, you know, two or three examples of maybe a homophobic comment on Twitter is cherry picking uh, to an extreme level. Uh, and it and it isn't really, it isn't really getting us anywhere. That yeah, like what I you know like to see is like uh, if um, you know if a person on the traditional marriage side you know um, you know make make the case why you know I, I think that you know marriage should remain because you know a child needs a mother and a father. I'd like to make them see you know that case, and then the pro same sex marriage people can say you know I disagree with that, and here's my evidence, and we can. Uh, and we can have this debate, uh, debate with, you know, just using facts and figures, you know, rationally rather than, you know, breaking into hysterics. Like, I want to see, you know, the facts and figures put forward so people can make up their minds. And I read this in The Australian. Maybe, this was a comment of one of the writers, maybe the left is trying to stop this because maybe these um, 64 same-sex marriage, 40 against, aren't accurate. Maybe it's more of a, a 45, you know, 55, or maybe it's a 51, 49, and it's quite a lot closer. Uh, that was an interesting point. And I think you, you uh, were talking earlier, and you said the betting market for this is actually tight. So it's always a good indication where people put in their money uh, to what's actually happening. But I think that the left is trying to stop debate on this issue and they want a parliamentary vote. And I think they're trying to make this a big, uh, Labor's trying to make this a big election, um, election pledge next election. But ironically, they stopped it in the Senate. 
Oh, well, Labour have said that regardless of the result, even if it comes back, no, they're just going to ignore that and legislate same-sex marriage anyway if they win the next election. Well, um, it's interesting because I was reading that there are um, socially, there's social, there's social conservatives within the Labour Party as well, and to assume that um, every Labour MP will vote for same-sex marriage, I think, is a bit silly, and to assume that every uh, Liberal MP will vote against it, silly, if there is a conscious vote, I think that it will be quite close. Um, if it were to go to a vote, we should wait at this stage, we, we're definitely looking like we'll get a, a, a postal survey. Uh, but that's non-binding as well, which further adds to the mystery and confusion uh, in this long, arduous debate. Oh, well, Labor uh, says they're, they're going to be moving to a binding vote in 2019, which even, you know, these uh, social conservatives in the, the Labor Party, they'll be first to, uh, forced to vote for it uh, as well. That's why... Um, uh, uh, former Labor Senator Joe Bullock resigned because he said, you know, I can't be a Labor Senator and uh, eventually be forced to vote for same-sex marriage. And I think that that, in a sense, is very honourable. Um, and I think that that's very good. Uh, there was a legislative, a member of the Legislative Assembly in New South Wales, I think it's Peter Phelps might be his name, um, he resigned because he uh, didn't, I, I believe he didn't want to, um, he, he, he thought issuing, a, I think it was some kind of tax or forcing WZ10 or something like that on petrol was an illiberal principle and he resigned from the party. So I think that people resigning on principle is a good thing and it's inherently undemocratic this binding vote saying that no, none of the backbenchers can have a free and open opinion. They have to go tunnel vision. Um, with our mission. I think that that's not very good or healthy for democracy. Well, I know that uh, one socially conservative Labor Senator, Don Farrell, he said uh, once it does um, uh, become binding, you know, I'll vote for it even though it's against my conscience. So he's going in the opposite direction. Well, a lot of these politicians are careerists, so yeah. whatever they can do to hold their seat up. Uh, we'll move on to our final topic now, which is it just broke this afternoon. We're recording this uh, Thursday, 17th of August 2017. Pauline Hanson, she showed up to Question Time in the, the Senate today wearing a full burqa covering the entire face. Uh, now, it's it's come out of nowhere in sort of my, my opinion because Pauline Hanson's not really known for pulling stunts like this. So uh, she, she came in in a burqa and then she threw it off dramatically to uh, ask a question of George Brandis whether, you know, his government would consider banning the burqa. And uh, George Brandis, he said, like, the government wasn't going to ban the burqa. And he, like, and, and, and he said, like, you know, this is a disgraceful, like, insult to, you know, Muslims and, you know, I, you know, work with, like, the Islamic, you know, community and, like, even, like got teary and like it was like it was it was really like I, I, I couldn't believe how like how emotional George Brandis got and it was interesting that uh, his uh, answer it got a standing ovation from Labour and the Greens but his own side pretty much stood still or sat still should I say I think that um, George Brandis could try out for home and away personally he's uh his acting was remarkable, uh, really tr showing his uh, true colours there, Georgie Boy, getting a rapture of support from the Greens and Labor. Um, and he obviously doesn't believe in freedom of expression or free speech to a large extent, does he? And, and it's a debate anyway whether the burqa is actually a requirement of, you know, Islam. I mean, there's there, there's plenty of, like, uh, Muslim women who, you know, don't wear it. There's some Muslim women who don't even wear any head covering at all. Well, it's, it's, it's about liberty, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's about individual choice. And to ban a whole class of people from, or a whole group of people, a whole religion of people wearing an item of clothing is, uh, well, it's, it's, er it's, well, it's erroneous and it's liberal and it's, it doesn't really, um, it isn't really Australian. But to the same extent, putting a curtain around a swimming pool 
and saying that men can't swim here, it's only women, Muslim women, who can swim in this area, that's also inherently wrong and bad as well, and, it, and it's un, that's un-Australian as well. Um, but definitely there are security concerns with the burqa, um, and also banking as well, or going into a bank, someone put an armed robbery, or going into Parliament, I believe that um, uh, that, that was interesting. Anyone could walk into Parliament um, disguised in a burqa, and, and it's a true um, security concern. So balancing liberty and um, national security um, is, is crucial uh, in this debate, but also realising when in Rome, who was a Roman school, and trying to change someone else's culture, such as erecting a swimming pool or modesty laws or whatever could come in, uh, that, that is wrong as well. Yeah, I, I think the uh, definitely the burqa is over the top for um, for Australia. The fact that it covers you know a whole face. I mean, we live in a society where you know you're supposed to see people's faces, and it was interesting the reaction of uh, the senators there. I mean, clearly they were confronted by Pauline Hanson wearing that. So you know, did she, you know, did she prove a point there by you know? Uh, highlighting that yes it is you know a confronting uh, thing to you know people who you know they're they're seeing seeing you know well you know who we think are you know women underneath that I mean it's it's just not the way our society works I don't have a problem with the burqa I have a problem with the niqab which has about this much of the woman you can see. And it's very hard to judge uh, and, and gain an understanding of someone's character. Can't look at someone's face. If someone's hair and ears are covered, I don't have so much of a problem with that. But if you can't see any of them, bar a one and a half inch gap here, that is a problem. Um, and I don't know how we can deal with it. Can, can we go around uh, the western suburbs of Melbourne and Sydney and and find people for wearing burkas. I don't really know how we deal with it. Um, it's it's a really difficult. Uh, it's very nuanced. Um, there's a lot to consider. But it's certainly, yeah. As I said, it's it's certainly not not something that we want to see. You know, more of we. You know, we we do, we don't want to see women. Like most of the time, they they are forced to uh, forced to wear it. Like we, it's it's clearly something we don't want to see more of. Well, we don't want to see more of a lot of things that um, some of the more fundamentals and even some of the more mainstream elements of Islam bring into Australian society. Child marriage, I was reading in the Australian again, a 14-year-old young lady got married to a 37-year-old man, I believe, by the local imam. Uh, you, you're seeing increased uh, child or female genital mutilation, which is disgusting. Um, and uh, there's, there's very, very high, extraordinarily high uh, amounts of welfare recipients among Muslim migrants. So they're not actually going to work. A lot of them are not um, assimilating very well. And there obviously are exceptions. I've met some great Persians who have been doctors, engineers, what have you. You can't stroke with a broad brush, brush. Generally speaking, there are a lot of elements with Islamic culture that aren't compatible with Australian culture, liberal culture. Uh, do you think, like, Hanson, politically, like, it, it was the right thing to, to do this stunt, to, like, bring attention to the issue, or was it, you know, it was... Did it, did it go too far for, like, a par uh, to do this in Parliament? I don't think it went too far. But what her motives were, were, that, were they to start a frank and open discussion about um, the appalling treatment of some Islamic women uh, and the niqab and the burqa and, and all that. If, if that was, if it was to stimulate public discussion, like, like what Trump does, for instance, makes an outlandish comment, but it stimulates discussion and actually gets people talking to each other about an issue. That can be highly productive, mind you. But if it was just to gain a few cheap votes, uh, that's a bit more sinister. I'm not for that. But if, if her motives were genuine and pure of heart and they were to start a discussion about the poor treatment of women in Islam, I have no problems with it. Yeah, 
I mean, it's certainly it's got a it's a rally to supporters around around her, so it's certainly got them uh, energized, and it's uh, earned a ridicule from uh, you know the usual uh, <laughs> the usual people who've never liked her anyway. So yeah. Uh, I, I do hear that she's got more to more more to say on, on the the burqa. So I'm sure she'll you know come up with you know more of an explanation of you know why she did this in the manner that uh, she did this. But um, that's all we've got time for on today's day's show. So thank you, Jacob, for for coming on and making your debut. Pleasure indeed, Tim. Great being with you. All right, everybody, so the usual reminders apply at the end of the show. If you haven't signed up to the email list, please do so at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon. We've arranged some awesome benefits for people who choose to support us. Unshackled merchandise is, on, is now for sale at uprightmarket.com. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.